it's a whiskey glass. All right, good, good afternoon uh, and, and welcome everybody here and uh, also who are watching the stream at home or at their offices. My name is Jussi Niemelän and I'm editor and writer with Helsinki Sanomat across the street. Um, to start with, we have a change in program uh, due to weather. Sivatlan uh, Tihanoiskan's plane is delayed, uh, but she has landed in Helsinki, so she should be here within uh, half an hour. So we start with the panel, and I'm, 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 I'm joined here uh, by um, a renowned expert on Belarusian and Russian uh, politics, program director Arkady Moses from Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Welcome. And, and postdoctoral fellow uh, Kristina Silvan, also from the Institute, who've done uh, extensive field work in Belarus for her doctoral thesis, which she successfully defended earlier this year at the University of Helsinki. Uh, so we have half an hour with talk. We talk here, then we'll have uh, Sviatlana Tsihanouska come here. She will give her keynote address, uh, and then uh, we'll have some questions here. But after that, you are welcome to ask questions from her as, as well. Um, <clears throat> my work has been made easier today because the invitation already had a great many questions. And one of them is the, uh, the headline of the event is... Uh, is Belarus at war? Um, well, we know that under international law, Belarus is a part of the war. But I was thinking maybe we could um, just remind the audience how, how it is a part of the war and how likely you think uh, it will join the invasion and sending the troops to, to Ukraine. Arkady, would you start? Yes, thank you very much, UC, and very good afternoon to everybody. I'm glad to see that the weather was not able to scare off so many people from attending this event. Really pleasure to talk to you this afternoon. Is Belarus at war? Definitely yes. As the regime and as the country. Uh, in the very first General, UN General Assembly resolution from 2nd of March this year, Belarus is directly named an aggressor state because its behavior fits one of the points in the classical definition of aggression. Namely, providing your territory to the second state, to another state for the aggression against the third state. So it's, 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 a, it's a hit. Uh, there's nothing to interpret here anymore. Uh, throughout the past 10 months, Belarus was used, Belarusian territory was used for preparing an attack in the invasion of Ukraine because the Russian troops were concentrating on the territory of Belarus. It was used for air and artillery raids against Ukrainian territory. Allegedly, Russian soldiers, Russian wounded soldiers were treated on the Belarusian territory. Uh, now, uh, there is a joint grouping of forces which nobody knows what it is preparing for, but it's a, it's a known case. Uh, and own, not an own. Uh, and even interestingly enough, Belarusian private, one of the Belarusian private postal services was involved into sending the loot which the Russian soldiers brought to the territory of Belarus from, U from Ukraine. So obviously, it's at war, and it's not just the regime. Again, I repeat, it's the whole state. And this is how it's codified in international documents. But that's not the whole story. Because Belarus as a nation is not at war. Uh, there is a strong resentment among the majority of the Belarusian population vis-a-vis -vis what's going on, vis-a-vis -vis the behavior of the own regime. Uh, there is a majority which is against the behavior of the Belarusian regime. And that's a major difference between the the attitudes of the Russian population towards what the regime is doing and the behavior of the Belarusian population. And it's easy to explain. There are at least three fundamental reasons why Belarusians are different from Russians. One is that in the Belarusian national memory, 
the Second World War is not about victory. It's about, or it's not about victory only. It's about hardship, it's about suffering, it's about casualties, it's about death, it's about destruction. So they certainly do not want this to be repeated towards their country. Russians, unfortunately, have forgotten. They jump immediately whenever they talk about the war into the May 9th, 1945, really forgetting what had preceded that date. And that's what Putin's propaganda uses. Second, Belarusians are free from some call an imperial gene. That's probably too strong, but an imperial sentiment. They are comfortable within the territory that their country has. And three, they're close to Europe. The way Belarusians know Europe is again completely different from the way Russians know Europe. They don't learn it through TV. They have a lot of personal experience. They live on the border, they travel. Belarus was a country which was receiving most per capita Schengen visas in, in preceding years. Uh, and that attitude of the people of Belarus towards the war, that unwillingness to accept that they might be dragged into the war, is what actually a major barrier between them or their country and the, its full participation in the war. It's because they don't want it, they are not at war. If Russians showed the same kind of behavior, we could easily imagine that also Russia would not be at war against a neighboring state. Will they be at war? I don't think so. Because Lukashenko understands that if they do enter the war, probably the days of his regime will be numbered. If they enter into the war, the Belarusian own troops will be very quickly defeated by the experienced Ukrainian army. <coughs> And what kind of consequences will follow in the country is difficult even to imagine. So that's why he might be using the argument about the unwillingness of his people to convince Putin that he should not be involved. That's why, uh, and I, I, could, I could give some other reasons, but probably I stop here. So the Belar Belarus is at war, Belarusian nation is not, and this is probably how it's going to stay for now. Christina, do you have something to add? Well, um... I'd like to add a little footnote um, about some Belarusians that actually are at war. And these are the volunteers of the Kalinovsky Battalion who have formed a unit uh, fighting on the side of the Ukrainian army. So, so some Belarusians are uh, participating in this war. Um, it's not a huge number of them, but the fact that they are there is, I think, quite significant. And it's, it's actually grown, it's a regiment already, so it's not only a battalion, battalion any, anymore. Uh, Arkady, you, you said that uh, Lukashenko has been able to convince Putin with, uh, with the fact that the Belarusians are against the war, but how, how, how independent Belarus is now with uh, you know, when, when Lukashenko crashed the uprising, he had to get closer to, to Russia. Uh, how, how independent actor Belarus is uh, as a country? Well, the Russian regime is not an independent actor. Uh, has not been for at least 12 years. For me, the count is the presidential elections of December 10. Before the elections of December 10, he had a chance. After that, when he chose Russia over the West, he had no chance. Economic dependence of Belarus on Russia has been growing. Sometimes Russian subsidies have been reaching 15 to 20 percent of Belarusian GDP annually. Militarily, ideologically, because these people belong to the same club, he is building a relationship of vassality and suzerainty. He's doing that deliberately. It's a really medieval relationship because vessels would have a certain autonomy. The land is yours. What you do in that land is yours. For as long as you follow the rules, and the rules are the rules of geopolitical competition. Lukashenko knows where the red lines are. He never overstepped them. He was always there to help Russia when Russia needed and to the extent Russia needed. 
Uh, and this is where he is. So for me, the key point is to understand how much Russia actually needs and wants. And with my colleague Rehor Nizhnikov, we've been arguing for, for some years that it actually Russia that not only defines the boundaries and rules of the game, it's also Russia that dis defines the boundaries which it itself is not going to overstep. Namely, that the territorial annexation of Belarus by Russia doesn't make sense for Russia without Ukraine. If it could annex Ukraine, probably the fate of Belarus would follow soon. But without Ukraine, it makes no sense. It would be difficult to sell domestically. It would still cause some resistance. So what Kremlin needs is control. And control is what it has, both territorial and political. Lukashenko is allowed to speak, sometimes not in a very polite manner, although not in recent years. But that's probably the only thing that, the, the only freedom, the freedom of expression, quote unquote, it's the only freedom that he's still allowed. Yeah, I would say that there was actually some ideological independence that Belarus had prior to the events of 2020, the rigged um, presidential election and the repression, because um, although this thought that there was in Western Belarusian relations after the annexation of Crimea didn't really uh, mean balancing between the West and Russia, just, you know, following what Arkady just said, but there was this idea that uh, Belarusians had a different understanding of the world around them, they valued the independence of their state, and there was no, you know, movement to join Russia. So this idea about independent Belarus was supporting, supported in the, in the society. Um, and also Lukashenko, you know, endorsed uh, this idea but of course, after 2020, the situation has been a lot more difficult. And we see it, for example, in the media sphere with uh, the Kremlin's narratives really becoming mainstream in Belarus. Whereas before, um, Lukashenko had his own propaganda apparatus and own narratives that were not always the same as those of Russia. So, uh, <clears throat> Before 2020, there was lots of talk about the multi-vector foreign policy of, 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 of Belarus, meaning that after 2014, uh, they started getting better relations with the, with the West. Mm. And uh, Ulajmir Makei, who died very suddenly just two weeks ago, who was seen, he was the foreign minister who was seen as the um, architect for, the, for this multi multi-vector foreign policy and kind of uh, uh, getting, getting better ties with the West. Uh, I, I think Arkady already, already thinks that Mackay's uh, death and new foreign minister probably wouldn't change much, but what do you think, Christina? I ask you first now. Yeah, I mean, I also don't see much of a change, not in the contemporary, you know, political setting. Um, the thing with uh, the Belarusian political system is that uh, indeed individuals who serve Lukashenko don't really seem to have much agency. And, um, but of course, it's possible that Mackay has been playing some kind of a surprise role, um, you know, behind the scenes. We don't really know that, you know, it's these kind of regimes are actually really hard to analyze because so many things happen under the carpet. So um, it's possible that something will change, but to be honest, I don't really foresee that for now. Maybe I've been talking too much with Arkady. <laughs> yeah, our rooms are next to each other. <laughs> uh, I agree that Mackay was not an architect of the uh, rapprochement with the West. He was a face of it. The decision must and could only have been taken by Lukashenko itself. And we don't know what kind of decision that was. Mm -hmm. We can try to reconstruct the decision. Part of the, part of the uh, motivation was clearly economic. Lukashenko was willing to milk two cows, which as we know is always better than to milk one cow. 
But he very quickly got disappointed about that. Because the West was not only giving it him money, it was not even promising him money. Because they were, again, the, the first big, which was already third, Raprashman of 2008-2010, was at least about the promise of money. The rapprochement on the normalization of 2015, 2020 was not about even the promise. That's why Lukashenko himself in one of his speeches talked it in Russian, it's Gavarilne, talk show. That was his attitude to the West because he saw these people coming to his gorgeous receptions during the Minsk Security Forum and other forums enjoying Belarusian hospitality, but then not offering any money in return. Technical assistance, yes which unfortunately went sometimes that far as the police, Belarusian police was trained by Western instructors. And uh, as I understand, even the equipment was given to it. But uh, the, the normalization happened, but the actual rapprochement simply could not happen for a reason, for a very simple reason. Belarusian regime is ideologically anti-Western. There is no trust between, and there cannot be trust between the Belarusian regime and the West. And the West also understood that. So if you talk to or would have talked to some Belarusians, you would, Belarusian regime representatives, you would immediately understand that they would see the West as pretending to play the game of rapprochement, not really playing it, because there was no readiness to go into clashes with Russia over Belarus, whoever would be presiding the Belarusian part of that game. So the West pretended the Belarus was a, that, that Minsk was a peacekeeper, which it wasn't. There was no peacekeeping role. Minsk was a place where Russians, Ukrainians, and Europeans negotiated, but it was not an actor. But Europeans wanted to praise Lukashenko at least for that. But it was, it was all rhetoric, it was all verbs. As for Mackay himself, that's also unfortunate, I'd say. Because Mackay was chosen, designated by the West as a personality the West wanted to deal with. The West immediately forgot that before the elections of 2010 and repressions, Mackay was the head of the presidential administration of Mr. Lukashenko. And because he was in that, worked in that capacity, he was under the Western sanctions. Please show me at least five publications, not counting mine, between 2015 and 2020, where this fact would have been paid attention to. Silence. Because he was an architect of the rapprochement with Belarus, which, as we argued just now, he wasn't. Yes, I mean, lots of time, it was obvious that he was, for him, all kind of rapprochement was uh, was just means and not 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 an end in itself. Um, but can I just you know point to a methodological note here? I know this is what I shouldn't be talking at an, at a sort of public event, but this shows you how hard it is to distinguish when individuals who are working for a political regime, how can we actually tell who the what they sort of true um, preferences are and how do we make sense of, of individuals or actors that really go change their political cause, you know, also after 2020, Mackay, you know, continued at yes, his job. Yes, yes, indeed, yeah. So it's impossible to really know who, who these people really are. We know that they're loyal, right? And that perhaps should be enough. And that's the only thing that matters. That's how they survive. Mm. by being loyal. But West also wanted to have some kind of relationship with, uh, with Belarus because they were, for geopolitical reasons, Belarus is bordering uh, uh, three NATO and EU countries. And uh, <coughs> for the West, it was best that Belarus is you know, as independent as, as it could be, right? It's very unfortunate that the West went into this new phase of rapprochement in 2015-2020, repeating not exactly the same, but same kind of mistake it had done vis-a-vis -vis Russia. In Russia, it chose Russian democracy, for, it exchanged, it traded Russian democracy for money. In mid-2000s, the pragmatic interests of European businesses 
started to prevail in European policies over the, 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 the value-based approach, as many of my colleagues have argued. In Belarus, the geostrategic, geopolitical interests started to prevail after 2015 over the question of the domestic liberalization and Belarus becoming potentially at least a democratic country. That was a mistake, and in both cases, the West is now paying dearly for that. Because had it approached Russia differently than it actually did, starting from mid-2000s, there is a good chance that the result would have been different already before. There is definitely a possibility that had they not started conducting towards Lukashenko the policy of sun warmth, some of the patterns of modern Belarusian development would have been avoided. Or at least what happened in 2020, the repressions and all that, would not have come as such a shock for the Western analysts. And politicians, unfortunately, and bureaucrats, unfortunately, and diplomats, unfortunately, who up until the last moment were, were sure that Lukashenko would not choose repressions uh, when he loses the elections. Again, what is the source of their thinking? Probably McKay and people like McKay and people from the McKay's apparat who were writing articles about how great the relationship was. So technically power politics over human rights. Uh... Weak power politics. Power yes. politics of those who do not understand power over human rights, which they understand, but are unfortunately are too fast to abandon when, it becomes a when promotion of democracy and human rights becomes a difficult task. In the case of Russia and Belarus, in the context of our today's conversation, in the context of some other countries, starting with China, in some other contexts. And it's not only the, the West that's paying dearly. I think now we could talk about the internal situation in, in, in Belarus. This Saturday, um, um, there was a Nobel Peace Prize. It was given to the wife of, of Ales Bialyatsky, who is a political prisoner in Minsk. And another famous, uh, well-known political prisoner is Maria Kalesnikova, who was heading the opposition's presidential campaign before 2020. She was taken to hospital for being very ill. <clears throat> what, is, what is the situation now within the, within the Belarus? Well, it's tragic and it's more tragic every day. That's, that's the sad reality. The really sad thing is that in summer and autumn 2020, people were really shocked and there was this idea that this can't go on, and yet it did go on. And the horrible thing is that it goes on up until today. So the number of political prisoners, which is now over 1,400, in a country size of Belarus, I mean, that's, that's really really incredible, really horrible. That's, that's less than 10 million. Yes, yeah, yes. Um, the fact that this figure keeps going up, the fact that it's not even the entire figure because not everyone wants their, you know, relative to be listed on, on this so that perhaps their treatment in the prison would be a little bit better. I don't even start talking about the, how people, how these pro political prisoners are treated in the prisons. Um, it's, it's really, heartbreaking. And what's even more, it, what makes me angry is the fact that, you know, the EU, which is supposed to be a powerful actor, has sort of just looked at that take place. It's uh, un uncomprehensible, really. Yeah, I think in November only, this November only, 300 people were detained for political, for political reasons. And this is also linking back to what they were uh, assumedly doing in 2020. So this is not new crimes. This is uh, the secret services and, uh, and the security apparatus. I can't even talk, talk about it as a security apparatus yeah. without the inverted commas. They're still hunting down people who might or might not have uh, participated in the protests in 2020. This is very important. It's indeed just to give you the understanding of scale. The number of political prisoners in Belarus today is six times the number of political prisoners in the Soviet Union at the moment when Gorbachev came to power. Just, it's, it's indeed mind-boggling. 
That's one thing. And the other thing is uh, a very soft reaction by the Western diplomacies, especially the European diplomacies, on everything that was going on there since starting since August 2020. Lukashenko himself, let me remind you, was not under sanctions until November 2020. Who and why was talking to him and in hope for what remains totally unclear to me. And the why is the most mind-boggling question. Only when Lukashenko started making his own mistakes, first when he hijacked the your EU plane flying from one EU country to another EU country in May 2021, people in Europe started thinking, oh, maybe this time we're not going for, towards another rapprochement. And only when he arranged a really serious migration crisis, on the, mostly on the Belarusian, Polish, and Belarusian, Lithuanian borders, then the possibility of a new round of dialogue was finally ruled out. And again, it's probably because it happens on, on the borders of countries like Poland and Lithuania, who then received a possibility to speak louder in a more influential manner than before. Otherwise, this, what, what I'm trying to say is that I will not bet my money on the fact that had he not done that, now, despite 1,500 political prisoners, we would not have had another round of, of nice conversations between the European, including Finnish, and, uh, and, and, and Belarusian diplomats. Unfortunately, I have all the reasons to suspect the situation would be the opposite. Uh, so what, what should the Western policy towards Belarus be? Now, uh, that's the final question that was also part of the invitation. Arkady, what? Uh, first of all, it has to be said and conveyed clearly that there will be no new rapprochement with Lukashenko. Europe attempted to do it four times in his history, in the history of his 28 years in power, four times. There is a joke that well, kind of, which is again the, the development of a famous phrase that history repeats itself. First time it's a tragedy, second time it's a farce. There is a new edition, third time it repeats itself for the stupid. Europe has needed, has not learned even the lesson after the four. Uh, so all these conversations that Lukashenko is better, Lukashenko in Minsk is better than Putin in Minsk, it's not axiomatic, it's debatable. Maybe not, we don't know. So the conversations that Lukashenko is better than many alternatives need to be stopped, and it has to be clear that this regime will be approached in a certain, very strict, restric restrictive and straightforward manner. But that's the easiest part of the deal. A much more difficult part of, 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 of the policy is the positive part of what you promised the Belarusian people. Sooner or later, these people and this country will be making a choice. They haven't made it yet, which is also unfortunate. Uh, but out of the six countries of the Eastern Partnership, that's the key country in that sense. We don't know what the historical future of Belarus is. We actually, we, we, we have all good reasons to believe that we understand what the historical future of Ukraine and Moldova is, what it potentially is for Georgia, and again, what it probably, probably is for Azerbaijan and Armenia. We have no idea of what it is for Belarus because Belarus still has to make its historical choice. There has to be an offer coming from the West that will help the Belarusians make the historical choice. If they don't want to make the choice in favor of democracy, liberal economy, markets, and stay closer to Russia, it's their right, and that's what has to be decided in a democratic way. But they need to know what the offer is. Unfortunately, there is no offer, zero. Uh, on the first component of, of, my, of what I'm talking about, there is at least something, as I said, that there's progress, there's less willingness to deal with Lukashenko. On the second component, there's nothing. Imagine 
Svetlana Tikhanovskaya would now say that we want to join the European Union. Would there be a pragmatic, professional, down-to-earth list of conditions that there would need to be fulfilled to make it happen? I doubt, because there's no debate about that. There's no thinking about that, but there's probably there is an inertial or instinctive willingness to say, well, maybe it's not the matter of time. We, we, will, we will need to live long to see what the future holds for you. What do you think? What would need to happen that the, the, the Belarusians really had this kind of window of opportunity to make the choice? The regime change. But, I mean, it's easier said than done, A. And B, much will depend on what kind of a regime change there will be. There can be a, a regime of personalities in power. It's, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's impossible to reproduce the Lukashenko system. But the new system might be no better than Lukashenko's system. It can be a collective leadership, but it can be a collective of crooks, collective of anti-Westerners, collective of tyrants, who all will be on the payroll of one neighboring country. And then the, the, this future does not promise anything good. Will, it, will the regime change happen because of Moscow's involvement? That's one story. Will it happen because of the own internal conspiracy? That's another story. Will it happen as a result of one more wave of democratic protest? That's a third story. But to make a long story short, without the regime change, uh, it's impossible to, to expect anything. With the regime change, the window of opportunities will be open. But would, would it also require a regime change in, in Moscow? Not necessarily. Because it didn't require, for instance, what happened in Ukraine and what happened in Georgia did not require a regime change in Moscow. It would require the will inside, uh, the readiness of the opposition forces to make a choice which would be different from the one of staying together with the Russian brothers, and of the Western readiness to react immediately. But uh, it's, it's definitely not a hopeless case. I think Belarus actually provides a lot of hope to all of us who still wants to see democratic, liberal, and economic market countries emerging and growing. Christina, what do you think? Do you, uh, do you have something uh, Yeah, I mean, this more? something that Arkady said was is really what I also think when it comes to the regime change, because the people of Belarus kind of tr dis try to make their, you know, everyday life as they, like, you know, to construct their own way of living after, in the 2010s. Uh, and this is something I've also been working on uh, in one of my publications. This idea that, okay, we have this state, which is like, we really don't want this guy in power, but let's see what we can do sort of outside the state, yeah. right? Yeah. There was this attempt, but then sadly it all uh, ended up in, in repression. So, so that, that road kind of ended there. I think that bubble always bursts at some point mm -hmm. when you try to be away from, the, from your government in, a, in an authoritarian country. Yeah, so now, I mean, of course, I also am hopeful seeing what happened in Belarus in 2020, but also I'm very, very sad in, in seeing what's happening in the country now and the fear um, that is quite justifiably uh, has entered people's, people's lives. And I don't think that these repressions will be forgotten as, as easily as the repressions of 2020 perhaps were forgotten? Uh, 15 months before the protests of August 2020, with my colleague, we wrote a paper which was called The Country of Today versus the President of the Past. And that's what matters, that, this, that structurally and fundamentally, this is a modernizing country, which is unfortunately governed by the ruler, who is archaic, who is retrograde, who is looking back, who has pragmatic brains. He has been manipulating Russia for 28 years, which is not a small thing. So he's certainly not a weak personality. But he belongs to the past. And the country has a future. And that's what gives us hope.
Yeah, there is a, the opposition is quite, um, most of the opposition is now out of the country. Uh, how, how hard is it, uh, the Belarusian nation, they, they, they haven't really experienced democracy ever. How, how easy it is to build a democratic Belarus, what do you think? Uh, what kind of help is needed uh, for, for that if there, if there is a chance for them to choose kind of a Western path? Well, for me, the biggest answer is, of course, to make sure that there is, you know, repression stops. Um, and then support is also needed, but I think, in a weird way, the lack of repression is, is the key. Yeah, but that's a starting point. The starting positions would not be bad. This is a country which, by post-Soviet standards, is practically not corrupt. There are special kind of forms of corruption, but this is definitely not what exists in many other countries. It's a law-abiding nation. And Europeans actually know what kind of institutions and how could be promoted when the opportunity presents itself. Well, thank you. Thank you, yeah. uh, Christina and Arkady, ladies and gentlemen, the leader of Democratic Belarus, uh, Svetlana Tsihanouskaya. Welcome. Uh, now we have Mika Aaltola. Starting with the uh, remarks. Thank you very much, Jussi, on, on, on taking us ahead. The schedule has been very tight, but I'm very honored and pleased to, to welcome uh, Svetlana Tsihanovskaya to Helsinki to this event organized by uh, Finnish Institute of International Affairs. This is your second time at our event, uh, 2020. You were here unofficially, uh, and you were received very gratefully by the whole nation of Finland. So I'm very happy that, that we had a chance to arrange an event around you. Um, back then, uh, you were invited by late uh, member of parliament, Ilka Kanerva, uh, of course, is in spirit with us here today. And also, I would like to express my utmost admiration when it comes to your leadership, when it, uh, leading things ahead in democratic, towards democratic uh, Belarus. So without any further ado, uh, I would yield the floor to you. So. Good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Hi. Uh, you know, I really want to sincerely thank the Finnish Institute uh, of International Affairs for hosting uh, me again. Many thanks to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and personally to Minister Pekka Havista for the constant and principled support of the Belarusian struggle for freedom and democracy. Over these challenging years, Finland has become a good friend on Belarus. And I'm sure that this friendship will bond our nations for decades. And your solidarity makes us stronger. Last year, uh, we discussed the theory of change in Belarus negotiations and how to release political prisoners. Since then, the situation has worsened dramatically. The number of political prisoners has doubled. The regime dragged the country into the criminal war and Belarus appeared on the brink of losing its independence. Before our eyes, the dictator Lukashenko has, involved, uh, into an international, uh, has evolved into international terrorists. The hijacking of the Ryanair plane and the migration crisis on the border with our neighbors were just the first alarms. The war in Ukraine became a continuation of the crisis in Belarus. By destroying civil society, Lukashenko has prepared the suitable conditions for Putin's invasion to Ukraine. The whole country became a launching pad for the Russian army. It's possible that we would avoid many human losses if back in 2020 we had rallied and stopped the tyrants 
and if the world's reaction was braver and faster. Obviously, the situation in Belarus and Ukraine cannot be compared. Still, uh, the root of the problem is the same, revanchist, aggressive Russia, which doesn't see either Belarus or Ukraine as independent states. As Alice Belyatsky, Nobel, Pri uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner, has said, Putin wanted to make Ukraine the same as today's Belarus, politically and economically dependent dictatorship, where the voice of the oppressed people is not heard and independence is ghostly and weak. On Saturday, I was honored to attend the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony. I listened to the speech of Natalia, the wife of Alice, and she was quoting him. In this speech, Alice said that freedom is inseparable from independence and national awareness. We learned this lesson well over the years. Not only Lukashenko, but also the Kremlin propaganda was trying to erase the Belarusian identity as if it had never existed. Protection of the freedoms and Belarusness was Alice's mission. He fulfilled uh, this mission for all his life since Soviet time. Many years ago, Alice has warned that humanitarian crisis of Belarus could grow into a full-fledged geopolitical threat. And he was very right. Today, Alice is in prison with almost 1,500 of, our pol of other, other political prisoners, including six of his colleagues, human rights activists of Vietnam. Overall, uh, there are more than 5,000 people in prison for political reasons, and some of them face the death penalty. Since the war started, the repressions intensified and became harsher than in 2020. People are tortured. They are beaten and humiliated. They are forbidden to see relatives or receive letters and food parcels. Political prisoners must wear special labels and not to speak with other prisoners. The regime takes revenge on those who resisted him in 2020 and also those who support Ukraine in 2022. There are many former officials and military officers in jail, which means this resistance is not limited to opposition activists only. 86% of Belarusians are highly against the participation of our army in this war on the side of Russia. This figure shows that solidarity with Ukraine has united Belarusians even more strongly than our 2020 revolution. From the first days of the war, despite the horrific repressions, tens of thousands of Belarusians took to the anti-war protests. We revived the network of Samizdat. Leaflets and self-published newspapers are being put in mailboxes every night. Our cyber partisans hacked the railways and Russian oversight committee and leaked, obtained data to journalists. Railway partisans, despite the threats of death penalty, committed 80 acts of sabotage on the railways to stop the advance of Russian machinery. Ukrainians are particularly grateful for the project Belaruski Hayun. 30,000 volunteers take photos and videos about the location of Russian troops and missile launches to warn Ukraine. We know of at least 17 Belarusian military volunteers who sacrificed their lives defending Ukraine. And we feel responsibility before them too. We cannot bring back, back their lives, but we can do everything possible not to let there be more. In Belarus, unlike in Russia, there is no public support of the war. You will not see the, this Z or V signs on the streets of our cities. You will not see the queues of young people who want to become the soldiers. It is opposite. People use every opportunity to oppose the war and support Ukraine. This is why they have launched a massive propaganda campaign conducted by Lukashenko and Russia-affiliated media. Their narrative that Ukrainians are Nazi, that uh, uh, America is behind it, they try to quarrel Belarusians and Ukrainians. My team has um, contacted the social media companies to 
uh, trace lies and uh, block propaganda content. We understand that this is not war between Russia and Ukraine. This is a war between democracy and autocracy, between the past and the future, and the fates of Belarus and Ukraine are intertwined. Belarus is part of the crisis, but also part of the solution, and it must be solved in complex. Belarus shouldn't become a consolation prize for Putin. 10,000 Russian soldiers deployed in Belarus must be withdrawn, same as Russians must withdraw from Ukraine. If Lukashenko's regime decides to send Belarusian troops to Ukraine, it will be a suicide for him. They, our soldiers will not obey, they will defect, uh, they will, will change the sides. Therefore, he pays Putin with sovereignty and signs deals that must tie Belarus to Russia forever. We must insist that all the agreements signed by the illegitimate dictators are not valid. The people of Belarus terminated their contract with the dictator long ago. Since 2020, Lukashenko has been unemployed. But now he is also a war criminal and a traitor to the national interests of the Belarusian people. He must appear before an international tribunal. Also, it's crucial to distinguish between the Belarusian people and the regime. Belarusians stand on the side of Ukraine. Therefore, it's critical to assist Belarusians who resist the regime and support Ukraine. It's also essential to show Belarusians the positive alternative, something to fight for. Therefore, I ask the European Union leadership to mark the European perspective for Belarusians. It would be a strong message and inspiration for many. And we made the first step in this direction. Together with the European Union Commission, we have announced a trivial package for Belarus after democratic changes. Dear friends, you know, uh, walking uh, around Helsinki today, I was thinking about the complex history of the Finnish people, about your experience of confronting the empire. In the last century, Soviet authorities probably planned to capture Finland in three days. The Soviet army attacking Finland didn't expect tough resistance. But the people of Finland surprised the whole world. Everyone came out to defend their land. By uniting everyone's efforts, by uniting everyone's will for freedom, you have shown that no one can subdue a free people. And your experience of fight inspired Belarusians, but also Ukrainians. I do not doubt that the people of Ukraine will win their freedom. And I do not doubt that the Belarusians will not stop until they, until they get their freedom back. And I hope that none of us will stop until we defend democracy on the continent. So the history of Finnish resistance can be a lesson for all of us. Only by uniting can we win. And we have to join forces and fight against tyrants together with the free peoples of Belarus and Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Tsiannouskaya. Um, you already answered the, the main question that it's uh, standing on, on the screen that the, is, is Belarus at war? You said the, that the regime might be, but the nation is not. Uh, and we, you already mentioned the, how dependent Lukashenko is on, on Russia, but how independent is Belarus? Franak here, your, your main aide, has called uh, Belarus currently, reminds him of, of Vichy France. How, how, how would you say, how, would you, how independent is Belarus? How independent actor is Lukashenko? Uh, you know, Lukashenko for many years built his policy on dependence of, on Russia. And now this dependence is only increasing. Uh, now, uh, in uh, military sphere, in economy, in political sphere, uh, of course, the Russians uh, influence Lukashenko's decisions a lot. What Lukashenko is actually controlling is uh, repressions against uh, Belarusians. So, and uh, the presence of Russian troops, of course, it's like uh, de facto military occupation of Belarus. 
so I think that uh, now the voice of uh, uh, democratic world should be much stronger, you know, to uh, tell now to Russia that, look, uh, Belarus should be independent and we respect sovereignty of uh, Belarus and all the troops should be withdrawn. Your, um, uh, you shouldn't influence, you know, the, the fate of Belarus. It's only up to Belarus and people to decide. Like, like you said, the, the Belarusian uh, people are very strongly against the war. And that has been seen as the main reason why uh, Lukashenko has not sent, uh, taken part in the invasion by sending the troops to Ukraine. What do you think? How likely is it to remain the same, or is there a danger that Belarusian troops will be sent to Ukraine as well? You know, I think this danger was uh, much higher at the beginning of the war, uh, when uh, the war only has started, you know, Lukashenko was sure that uh, there will be a blitzkrieg, you know, and he will be on the side of the winner, and uh, when the first small victories will be achieved, the Russian army could join. But then, uh, when it became evident that this blitzkrieg failed, you know, of course, he uh, wouldn't like uh, to share responsibility for this war, and that's why he doesn't want to uh, send the Russian army. But not only for this, you know, the main signal for him was done at the very first days uh, of the war when uh, uh, anti-war rally took place, when this acts of sabotage took place, when uh, our soldiers... Uh, in the uh, like messages, like secret messages uh, through public, um, uh, through media, showed that uh, they, uh, they don't ho have anti-war, anti-Ukrainian amb uh, ambitions. They don't want to fight. They don't see Ukrainians as our enemies. And Lukashenko understood that there is no support from the society of this war. And of course he's afraid because, uh, you know, he's, he's afraid of his own people of his ex-own people. He's not, <laughs> he doesn't own uh, Belarusians. But uh, now I think that um, all this, uh, it's almost impossible that our Belarusian uh, soldiers would join uh, Russian army, but of course our land can be used as launching pad again and again and again. And um, maybe, you know, we see that this training are going on, some echelons with Russian equipment and troops are coming to Belarus. But it looks like performance for Belarusians and performance for Ukrainians, that something is going on, we are preparing for some attacks or, or whatever. They want, of course, to distract attention of uh, Ukrainian troops from hot spots on the, on the east to uh, Belarusian border. They want to threaten uh, also um, Europeans that now we will attack, you know. But uh, I think it's like um, a show, you know, show to, to uh, you know, for, 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 uh, for democratic world. And what should the democratic world do? You mentioned some things, uh, what the EU should do, but what, is there some concrete steps that the, the West should do in its policy towards Lukashenko and, and, and Belarus? Uh, first of all, not to overlook uh, Belarus in, uh, in these events. Because what I see now is that uh, everybody is uh, uh, building strategy how to uh, release Ukraine. It's absolutely understandable. We fully support this. But we don't see uh, that any strategy exists towards Belarus. We realize, as I said, we don't want Belarus to be a consolation prize for Putin. When you, uh, you know, after, of course, sort of negotiations, you know, Ukrainians, uh, Ukraine will release their lands from Russian troops and they will still be on Belarusian territory, what then? Uh, so uh, now Lukashenko is like, uh, he, he's hiding behind the war. He's like, uh, can terrorize uh, population without any responsibility for this. Um, we are asking for, uh, like, uh, more economical, political pressure on Lukashenko. And uh, for him, for he doesn't feel that, you know, I'm just somewhere aside. It's not my war. I'm not participating. You know, you have to punish Russia, but not me. He has to 
share the full responsibility for war crimes. His uh, crimes against Belarusians also shouldn't be forgotten because, of course, I understand that uh, what's going on in Ukraine is awful, and people uh, sometimes think that uh, atrocities that take place in Belarus and Belarusian prisons with Belarusian people are not so like. Uh, pride or important as uh, murders, uh, you know, in Ukraine. Of course, these are different levels, but it also um, need attention of uh, uh, human rights committee, of uh, uh, of uh, international uh, like attention. Uh, we don't want to attract attention from uh, Ukraine, but. We don't want Belarus to be forgotten as well because Belarusian people feel this and uh, Belarusian people need energy to continue our fight. It's very difficult and when people think that we are forgotten, we are abandoned, you know, so we are alone. It's difficult for people to, you know, to, to give this energy, to, to have this energy inside. And one thing about repressions, we talked earlier and you mentioned also that there are almost 1,500 political prisoners and now the death penalties. I'd, I'd like to remind that uh, Belarus is the only country in Europe that doesn't have moratorium on, on death penalties. So Belarus has been executing people all these, all these years mm -hmm. and now as well. But now we have another uh, eight minutes for questions uh, from, from the audience and from, from here. Do we have uh, any questions, please? Raise your hand and also mention who you who you are. And will Christina do you have no? And 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 turn the, the mic on and, and off. Sinebuka. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for very interesting discussion on on Belarus. Um, um, Svetlana Tsihanovskaya mentioned, and also Arkady mentioned, the aspect of uh, generational differences. And so my question is that, do we just have to wait until the newer generation comes to age? Uh, because in the speech, uh, Svetlana Tsihanovskaya mentioned that this is a war between past and the future, um, and that um, Lukashenko is definitely uh, man of the past, mm -hmm. uh, which I, of course, clearly <laughs> agree with. And Arkady, you mentioned something that um, um, something along the same lines. And also, when looking at um, strategic communication, for example, between um, uh, in Ukraine and then on the other hand in Russia, one also feels that there is a generational difference, that on the other uh, side you have a younger generation that expresses itself in a different manner and represents different kind of world um, and different kind of values, whereas uh, Putin is surrounded by uh, he, people, men of his age, um, and social group, and somehow there is a dramatic difference between those uh, groups. So, um, is this uh, kind of a key element, or do you think that there is something uh, more dramatic and uh, more fundamental that needs to happen apart from kind of the new generation coming up? Uh, you know, I think that uh in Belarus, uh, this problem is not so relevant, uh, the difference between generations. Of course, our generation of our grandparents are, uh, you know, still the, the have this nostalgia of uh, Soviet Union, but I suppose it's not, it's nostalgia on the young years, you know, and when uh, back in 2020 we saw a huge amount of pensioners on the streets. We understood that uh, you know it's uh, not uh, the revolution of uh, younger generation. Uh, we saw that it was the revolution of uh, dignity because um, our pensioners also understand that they live in uh, with these very small um, pensions. They can't afford uh, medicine, they can't afford normal food, but so as they lived 
uh, through much more difficult time in Soviet uh, Union era, they think sometimes that I don't need much, you know, it's enough for me, like, uh, you know, so um, they were, uh, we thought that they were like uh, left in the past, uh, but we saw different picture during 2020 and now um, this movement of pensioners still exist in Belarus undergroundly. A lot of pensioners had to flee uh, Belarus, as well. a lot of uh, old generation people are in jail. Uh, so, um, and, you know, Lukashenko always uh, thought that uh, this uh, Soviet Union people were his electorate, the same as uh, working class. Uh, but in 2020, he discovered that uh, when he came on the main factory in Belarus and people were shouting to him, go away, uh, it was shock for him and he absolutely stopped uh, to rely on... Uh, stop relying on a Belarusian society and Belarusian community. So uh, now uh, young people are uh, telling their grandparents what's going on because old people can't, don't have access to the internet, you know. Uh, so we ask uh, uh, young people to talk to uh, their grand grandparents. It's extra attention what our uh, grandparents really need and also it's informing them about their uh, reality. Thank you. I was told that no more questions from the audience, but Arkady is not part of audience, so very short one, please. Uh, Svetlana Georgina, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I have a question, which is a fundamental one, of course, not a short. How do you see the future of Belarusian Russian relations? Which is, of course, easier ask than answer, but which is also the way of asking you a question whether you are an optimist or not. Uh, you know, it, of course, you know, Belarus want to be a good partner for all the countries, but with um, existing uh, Russia, as we call it, uh, Putinska uh, Russia, I think it's impossible to install reliable relationship. When, uh, you know, when the country can hit on your back, when the country uh, wants to restore the empire uh, despite the will of uh, the countries to develop in, in a different direction. Uh, so I hope that uh, indicates, I, I, know when, I don't know when it will happen, uh, you know, the uh, society in Russia also will change and they will be ready to have... Uh, uh, reliable, first of all, relationship, uh, relationship with neighboring countries. Uh, because it's not only um, the uh, responsibility of uh, government, it's responsibility for uh, the whole nation, you know, to understand that uh, uh, they uh, can't rule or dictate uh, the order uh, for, dictate the rules for, uh, for other countries. Because now we see that uh, a lot of, uh, I, I would say, majority of uh, Russians are supporting this uh, uh, this uh, feeling of revanchism, of uh, imperialistic ambitions of, of Russia, and it's pity to see. You know, uh, of course, I, I uh, know that there are some opposition movements in Russia, but they never also say clearly what, what how they see the future of Russia. Uh, do they see uh, the future as a huge empire, or they're ready, you know, to um, Smilica, to accept uh, uh, independence of, of uh, uh, Belarus, Ukraine, and other post-Soviet Union countries. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mrs. Tsianovskaya. Thank you, Kristina. Thank you, Arkady. Uh, thank you, everybody here. Thank you, everybody watching the stream. Now we have uh, 25 seconds for selfies, uh, if someone needs. Thank you so much.